pleasure to be here. I'm Pedro Pena Monteiro from the Spanish and Portuguese department here at Princeton. Uh, we have now a panel uh, which title is uh, What are Health and Care Today? Uh, I'll be very brief because you guys have the uh, bio sketches, so you know everything about everybody here. But we have here uh, Josefka Blyves from uh, the chair of the Preventive Medicine Department at USP, and who will be with us actually in the fall, Princeton. Uh, we have our dearest uh, and main host, uh, Joan Diu, who is a professor of the Anthropology Department and also here at the, the Ludolosi School. And we have uh, Nadia Vinais, who is also uh, a professor of the uh, Sociology Department at the University of St. Paul, and who was also a class and peers fellow uh, while ago. And finally, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Carolyn. We have Carolyn Krauss, who is also a uh, professor in the uh, anthropology department. This will, will be our discussion. I don't have the bells and sounds that Antonio said we had this morning, but I will really, uh, really ask you to please uh, try to, to be uh, within the 20 minutes we, we suggested. Otherwise, we will, we will not have time for questions. So with uh, and we'll, oh, okay, so I thought you were the first one, so please. Uh, it's a great pleasure and an honor for me to be here with so many nice colleagues, some teachers, bibliographical references, and uh, it's really it's really stimulant, but also a challenge. I'll try to do my best, but... Well, my... As, as uh, Gustavo, I won't talk about city exactly, but I'm going to talk about health and some issues of uh, belonging, of difference that may have to, uh, to do with the, the main theme of the, the seminar. Uh, okay. uh, I'm going to read because I, I would be, it would be very difficult for me to to speak spontaneously in English, it's not my language, and uh, for this I want to, to thank Heath Pearson very much for his review of my, my paper. Uh, my aim is to reflect on the concept of care as developed in the context of Brazilian health care reforms movement as a theoretical perspective for the reconstruction. May I hang this? Yes, you can. Maybe it will be easier. Thank you. Uh, in the sense of making them more effective in building technical data to be some responses to the health needs of individuals and their conditions. Uh, my speech will be divided into these, these five parts. The first one, SUS and the construction of healthcare practice, the context uh, of the, this, this conceptual construction. Brazil has gone through remarkable transformations since the 1980s. When the new Brazilian constitution was proclaimed in October 1988, a long period of dictatorship was formally terminated and a profound process of restructuring of social life had started in several areas of national life. This had thought, this had thought along with the political redemocratization, to, to construct social well-being projects that had been denied through the long period of accession. The field of he health care has played a central role in this process. In the 1980s, a powerful health care reform movement took place as a technical, scientific, and political field, shaping the matrix of the Brazilian national health system known as SUS. Over the last 30 years, the Brazilian health care reform movement has faced countless challenges at many levels. These challenges extend from the formulation of health policies to the technical structuring of health care models. Among these many tasks of the healthcare reform movement, I will focus on one, the construction of a conceptual basis for healthcare reform in Brazil that is generated by its emancipatory interests on democracy and social justice. Organic links between agents with strategic positions in the New Republic and in the SUS administration, along with the academic wing of the healthcare movement, engender a symbiotic relationship between political commitment and conceptual development. Within this context, the three fundamental principles of the health chapter in the new constitution became an agenda for knowledge production in Brazilian universities, that is, 
universal <coughs> equity and comprehensiveness, or integralidade, the, the best translation is comprehensive, although it's not exactly the same thing, I will comment on this. In brief, the principle of universal universality determines that all citizens should have access to the set of healthcare structures and services provided in Brazil. The principle of equity demands agreement that each individual or population group should be provided with what is necessary, that is to say, a commitment to distribute these structures and services equally according to the specific inequality within the Brazilian population. And lastly, the principle of comprehensiveness, which poses the challenge of knowing what can be done and how to do it with, within healthcare so that individual and population needs are met. Perhaps it goes be without saying that among these principles, it is comprehensiveness that is the one that bears the technological challenges of reconstructing the national healthcare system. Since universality and equity essentially refers to availability and access to different types of services. So now, let us turn our attention to comprehensiveness as it, its significance to the reconstruction of healthcare. Comprehensiveness difference as ethical value and technical criteria. The concept of comprehensiveness has various origins and influences. It is rooted in the US American concept of comprehensive medicine that reached Brazil during the 70s. But comprehensiveness was reconceptualized and implemented in a peculiar way by the healthcare reform movement. Though interested in its resistance to the fragmentation that characterizes the specialized medicine, the Brazilian approach to the notion of comprehensive medicine wanted to go beyond and combine the idea of integrating the diversity of medical knowledge to the contributions of social knowledge in order to better understand patients and to provide them with good care. This approach uh, not only so not only to make a richer and more integrated region of an individual's healthcare needs, but also integrate health assistance to public health reasoning and strategies. At the same time, the notion of comprehensiveness was incorporated into the political agenda of social movements. The most significant fact in this sense was the creation of the Comprehensive Care Program for Women's Health, the PAIS, at the intersection of the healthcare reform movement and the women's emancipation movement. PAIS was a milestone in the process of transforming the notion of comprehensiveness and the conceptual singularity that it had acquired within the context of the health care reforms in Brazil. The issues that were taken to be the objectives of PAIS ranged from dealing with old questions within women's health, such as contraceptive techniques, prenatal care, etc., to the inclusion of new topics that were not originally concluded in the old modern child health programs, such as questions of sexuality and sexual and reproductive rights. Epidemiology was called upon to sustain the foundations of clinical practices. Clinical practices were called upon to the manipulological <coughs> studies. Individuals, communities, and society as a whole then were to be involved in the Bayesian actions and policies. Furthermore, integration was also between biological and social dimensions. Gender perspectives thus permeated the reading of healthcare needs and responses. Working with women's health is at the same time to deal with the social roles and power relations implicated in maternity, sexuality, reproductive choices, etc. Over the course of the 90s in, and into the beginning of the 2000s, this expanded notion of comprehensiveness was widely disseminated throughout Brazil. Through both the reconstruction of medical attendance and the reconstruction of public health programs, this integrative imposes for individual collective technical, political, biological, social factors continue to meld, thereby anchoring the research, teaching, and extension agendas of the main universities throughout the country. Paths toward comprehensiveness have been opened up through diverse ways, including some that did not initially have this guiding principle in mind, but have nevertheless become the avenues along with which its construction passes. The conceptual framework of vulnerability which we will examine next is one such avenue. Vulnerability and social marks and difference. The field of public health was shaken around the world at the beginning of the 1920s by the AIDS pandemic. The traditional instruments of epidemiology and preventive strategies were accused of insufficiency in the face of the complexity of the determinants of the epidemic, along with the uncritical reproduction of stereotypes 
and prejudices that serve to further aggravate the capacity for effective responses. In Brazil, amidst the healthcare reform scenario, studies focusing strictly on risk analysis and preventive strategies based on behavior changes were soon perceived to be inadequate, if not harmful, to the reconstructive process that were underway. <coughs> The politicization of healthcare issues and the relationships established between illness and social determinants like gender, race, age, social class, religion, etc., uh, seem to be similarly reduced to a mechanistic reading that it equated the epidemic of AIDS to the simplistic formula misinformation is the same of infection. However, earlier examples such as Paris served as a, an alternative model. In addition, there was a growing sense of citizenship and political participation in the context of redemocratization, which led people directly or indirectly affected by the epidemic to promptly instigate powerful social protagonists by organizing and collectively fighting for their rights. By viewing the AIDS through the lens of vulnerability, the need to incorporate categories and mythos originated from the human sciences, particularly from anthropology, into healthcare studies and interventions became necessary. From the viewpoint of vulnerability and resorting to categories of interpretation and comprehension of social political nature, the dynamics of the distribution and growth of cases of infection and illness were clearly shown to have shared particular features that made it possible to distinguish deep inequalities in the paths and pace of the epidemic. Based on historical inequalities and deep rooted relationships of domination and oppression within Brazilian society. The homosexual identity was perhaps the first and most significant one in which the perverse relationships between oppression and vulnerability to AIDS epidemic were revealed. It was the first group that to be affected in epidemic form by the disease in Brazil, and stigma and discrimination against its divine practices underlie a series of negligent attitudes within public policies and healthcare services. It has been more than 30 years since the first case of AIDS was detected in Brazil, and there has yet to be any major media campaign consistently directed towards this population group. Studies of vulnerability also help illuminate the inadequate performance of AIDS prevention and treatment policies among women. The growth rate of the epidemic has decelerated among men at the end of the 90s, and the beginning of the 2000s, which did not happen among women. The decline in mortality rates due to AIDS over this period was also significantly uh, lower among women. Studies from using on gender have emphasized many difficulties, some of which are a low perception of risk among women, a delay to seek diagnosis and treatment, the privilege of care of their partners and children above their own treatment, cultural and relational barriers against adopting safe sex practices, including physical violence, and healthcare services are impassive with regard to integration of sexual and reproductive rights into the, agen the agendas for women's health provided within primary care as a whole. Similar processes have also revealed vulnerabilities linked with race. Black populations, and particularly black women, experience situations of exposure to the epidemic and the risks against protection there are more severe than within other racial groups. In fact, black people in Brazil present a situation of vulnerability to a large number of processes of becoming ill and weakening of their health as inheritors of the tragic social legacy of slavery and the almost complete absence of compens compensatory inclusion policies. Social difference in care. Implementing the principle of comprehensiveness and incorporating scenarios of vulnerability into concrete health situation analysis and actions depends on radical changes in healthcare processes. Transformation of the viewpoint regarding healthcare needs by crossing through different socially shaped identities and relationships produce tensions in relation to the traditional ways of organizing healthcare. There will be a need for a linkage between different forms of knowledge against uh, uh, agents and service sectors, but also, very importantly, there will be a need for new forms of interaction between healthcare professionals and the recipients of their actions. We are calling CARE uh, with a capital C, this reconstructive proposal for the technical nucleus of healthcare to distinguish from other established uses in ordinary language. CARE is to be a regulatory idea 
and can be synthetically defined as a search for healthcare actions constructed from dialogue-based interactions within an active interest in the practical meaning of the people experience health experience of health and illness, which results in shared definitions, objectives, and strategies for their healthcare as shown in this diagram. There is a series of important issues to highlight in this diagram. First, it draws attention to the fact that, irrespective to the difference in structural symmetries between the participants and healthcare relationships, the care proposal aims to remind us that in going beyond the positions of healthcare professionals and service users, there are subjects who interact, starting from and by means of techniques, but subjects. As subjects, service, service users will not allow themselves to be passively subsumed to the condition of objects of knowledge and intervention. But we must not forget professions are also subjects. They also have social cultural baggage, values and histories that cross through their professional actions and call their ways of interaction with the techno sciences and the use they 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 may obtain and the uh, the presence of the other who is asking for healthcare services. There is also the demand to pay attention to the always immediately relational nature of our identities when with other people in care actions. The dynamics of the intersubjective encounters rather than any prior professional or personal identities, although never independent from these, will characterize the nature of the care provided through the healthcare actions. In the intersubjective context through which healthcare actions are implemented, which are also inexor inexorable in any personal interpersonal encounter, now it circulates and organizes such meetings by constructing normative and objective standards that define what must be done and how it will be done. However, in contrast to the traditional type of healthcare based upon biomedical sciences, care privileges a complementarity between different types of technoscientific knowledge, producing an interdisciplinary dialogue in practice, especially with regard to human science. But care equally requires non scientific knowledge. Knowledge of the day-to-day -day life experience and traditions transmitted spontaneously through culture, which in traditional views is no more than an accessory uh, resource, if not simply noise, should form a structuring part of care. This is the knowledge that gives access to the existential meaning attributed to health needs and thus the basis for any effectively comprehensive care. Final <laughs> remarks. It's not. An answer. <laughs> uh, the guiding nature for that the comprehensive approach, the vulnerability analysis, and the markers of social difference may have in care seems clear. Both in the identifying healthcare needs and in defining strategies for prevention, treatment, or rehabilitation, they import particular nature to identities that not only indicate the concrete living conditions of specific population groups, but also reveal intentions for normative, normative validity that can be criticized, reflected, and debated. When social differences are considered by healthcare practices, they are transformed into a type of shortcut to synthesis between the possibilities for technical efficacy <coughs> and the necessities for practical success within different contexts of care. The set of reference points that, reference points that, are, that are mobilized which relate to relatively generalizable forms of structured social life with their physical, mental, cultural, and institutional correlates helps us to integrate the meanings of healthcare needs, demands, and responses. However, this fundamental quality may be uh, however this fundamental quality may be lost however, sorry, <laughs> this fundamental quality may be lost if the approximate provisional and relative nature of the identities that mark differences, gender, race, uh, age, etc., is not kept in view. If they can become absolute and untaken as an access to some type of substance of social life, then the accomplishment of care may be as damaging as, damaging as or more damaging than the rigid adoption of categories of biomedical technical sciences. For this reason, we must never uh, fail to ask ourselves, when thinking of care and the, the social marks of difference, what does it mean ethically and politically to take the perspective of gender, race, ethnicity as a differential in healthcare? 
In what way can the differentiation of those products be incorporated into healthcare process? And finally, what impacts do these processes actually have on the health and lives of people and social groups? Thank you. Great. My, my talk today is entitled Patient, Citizen, Consumers Claiming the Right to Pharmaceuticals in Brazilian Courts. While the justiciability of socioeconomic rights is of increasing interest internationally, the volume of individual right to health lawsuits in Brazil stands out. Brazilian states are seeing the number of successful lawsuits brought in their courts, particularly for access to pharmaceuticals, reaching into the tens of thousands, a process that is, according to officials and public health scholars, altering administrative practices, encroaching upon health budgets, and ultimately producing inequality. For the past five years, I have been coordinating a multi-sided ethnographic uh, study and, and legal analysis of right to health litigation in, southern, in the southern state of Rio Grande do Sul, trying to understand this judicialization of health from a grassroots perspective. And this, some of our partners, Mariana Socal is here with us today. Right, Mariana? Yeah. And Joe Amon uh, will be here tomorrow participating in the final panel. And Adriana Petrina will be here uh, today, today as well. And I will be showing photographs from Torben Askerot, who joined me in the field to do a visual documentary of these patient citizen uh, consumers and their mediators, the public defenders, the, the, the judges. With a population of 11 million, this state of Rio Grande do Sul has the highest number of such health-related lawsuits in Brazil. The number of new lawsuits grew, as you can see here, more than 1,000% in just seven years, from 1,126 new cases in 2002 to 17,025 new cases in 2009. The majority of these judicial claims involved access to medicines making up 70% of the cases in 2008 and 2009. Our task in our study was to find the people who are driving this judicialization, who are so often obscured by technical arguments and economic calculus, and to illuminate their travails. What is extraordinary in right to health litigation and why it is so important to study this phenomenon, it's not simply its ever-growing numbers, but the fact that it allows the re-entry of human voices in public debates about the object and scope of public health, the nature of care through and beyond technology, and the public-private interface in contemporary governmental institutions. In order to address these issues with some depth, let me begin with an individual story. A retired bus driver, Edgar Lemos, lives in a lower middle class neighborhood in Porto Alegre, the capital of Rio Grande do Sul. Dealing with significant motor difficulties, Edgar had to wait for more than a year for a specialized neurological appointment at a nearby public hospital. He was finally diagnosed with hereditary cerebral ataxia in November 2008. The neurologist prescribed the drug called Somazina, which is not included in any governmental drug formulary. Coming from a destitute family, Edgar had to work since the age of 11, of, of eight, but this is the, the, his uh, worker's card ID from when he was 11 years old. He was proud of the gated brick and mortar house he had built himself on the top of the hill. Edgar's ataxia affected not only his mobility, but also his sense of dignity and worth, as he made him more dependent on the wife and the two adult daughters. While Edgar felt that Somazina was helping to halt the, gener the generation of his motor abilities, he was also taking a number of other drugs, from statins to antihypertensive to anxiolytics to soothe additional symptoms. During a conversation I had with him over his dining table in August 2011, Edgar opened a box containing the five medicines that made up his daily regimen. As he held each one of them, in turn he said, this one I don't judicialize. This one I don't judicialize. This one I don't judicialize. I only judicialized this medicine because I went into debt paying for it. 
a monthly supply of somazina costs about $200. After paying for the drug out of pocket for several months, Edgar had to take out a bank loan. Unable to keep up with the house expenses and his loan interest, he had, in his words, no other alternative but to judicialize. He learned about the public defender's office from other patients, also waiting for specialists' referrals at the public health post, and then filed a lawsuit to compel the state to pay for his medication. Attorney Paula Pinto de Souza, who handled Edgar's case, says that the public defender's office has become, in her words, um hospital jurídico, a juridical hospital. As a legal advocate for the poor and chronically ill, she considers it her job to ameliorate suffering and to restore the rights of her clients. The person, she explains, comes here sick and wronged by the failure of public policies. We are beyond preventative medicine. Sorry, Professor. Is that Ricardo And here, the concept of health as physical, mental, and social well-being is no more. Judge Eugenio Terra issued a court injunction on Edgar's behalf, and he received the medicine for several months, but then the delivery stopped. He filed a new claim and won another injunction for three additional months of treatment. As the state attorneys were appealing the judge's decision, Edgar nervously anticipating having to renew the lawsuit again. As for why he was not judicializing the other drugs uh, he was taking, Edgar told me, I know that the state cannot give it everything to everyone. I have to do my part and pay for whatever I can. The lawsuit is only one part of Edgar's labyrinthine treatment ordeal. Judicialization is not an attractive option to begin with. And although it saves him money, Edgar must periodically renew the lawsuit with no guarantee that the drug delivery will continue. He, one could say that Edgar even prefers the position of the consumer instead of the citizen, as it gives him more control and confidence. The market in this case is more reliable than the welfare state. The medicine box Edgar, is Edgar's survival kit. Yet what does not fit in this box is the psychosocial care, for example, that could help Edgar improve his quality of life as the disease progresses, a lawsuit would not also not help him gain access to such services. Our research team, this is a little bit the, the very tentacles of the beast, which our research became over time, uh, moved across domestic, clinical, judicial, and administrative domains to track the interconnections of sites and the interplay of scales that the judicialization of health calls on and calls into question. And while examining the tense negotiations of the constitutional right to health in daily life, I often had a sense that social roles and institutional positions were out of place. The judiciary was acting as a sort of a pharmacy. The public defender as a physician. The physician as an activist saying, go and judicialize. The patient association as a legal counsel. And the patient citizen was becoming the consumer, among other translocations and displacements. In this paper, I explore how right to health litigation has become, in the, wake, in the wake of successful universal HIV treatment, an alternative for many Brazilians seeking to access health care, and how the right to health is increasingly understood as the right to pharmaceuticals. The relations between individual bodies, political subjectivities, medical technologies, and state institutions are compellingly rearranged along this judicialized front. Low and middle income patients are not waiting for new medical technologies to trickle down. They work through available mechanisms and instantiate new social fields to engage and adjudicate their demands, concretizing abstract human rights. And in the process, the judiciary is consolidated as a critical side of politics, if an unexpected one. Even if only cursorily, uh, let me place these realities in historical context, and uh, uh, Jose Ricardo and, and, uh, and Marcia have already done that before. Two concurrent and paradoxical trends inform the structure of Brazil's unified health system, known as SUS, which extended health coverage to all citizens in the late 1980s. On the one hand, greater recognition of the role of the government in the fulfillment of social rights 
through the democratic constitution of 98, and on the other hand, neoliberal reforms through which state functions were decentralized and outsourced to the private sector. While the federal government assumed a central role in public health funding, also managing some programs of prioritized disease uh, requiring high cost treatments, state and municipal health secretariats had to develop new structures to assess health needs and to manage funds for care delivery. This arrangement uh, delegated responsibility but did not ensure funding compliance and technical capacity for implementation. Thus, although Brazil has today one of the world's most advanced AIDS programs, many people go to public pharmacies only to find that basic me essential medicines are out of stock and that newer medicines they seek, as in Edgar's case, are not included in official drug formularies or listas pharmaceuticals. As I documented in the, in the book Will to Live, AIDS activists were among the first to successfully equate the constitutional right to health with access to pharmaceuticals. An increasing change in the concept and practice of public health has also been taking place in Brazil in the last decades. In terms of both delivery and demand, public health is now understood less as prevention and primary care and more as access to medicines and community outsourced care. That is, public health has become increasingly pharmaceuticalized and privatized. In this process, the country is becoming a profitable platform of global medicine. Brazil is one of the fastest growing pharmaceutical markets in the world with an estimated value of more than $25 billion in uh, 2012, and about 50% of the adult population, some 60 million people, uses pharmaceuticals on a daily basis. The judicialization of the right to health does not resist these trends, but it can, I believe, point to what's missing in health systems and provide a critical supplement as patients face the increasing privatization of healthcare, even within a public healthcare system. People often use the expression, entrar na justiça, eu estou entrando na justiça, to enter the judiciary, or literally, to enter justice, to refer to their lawsuits. There is a poetic force to this expression, the recognition of a generalized desire to want to belong to the body politic and to no longer live out of justice, the vision of a country with less inequality and discrimination. Recognizing that the judicialization of health raises questions not only philosophical, but also practical. And here we see Justice Joaquim Barbosa, the, the, the president of Brazil's uh, Supreme Court. The judiciary has by and large chosen as its main guide the concrete circumstances of patient litigants instead of abstract legal arguments. In questioning the place of the people in the design and implementation of public policy, the judiciary is also exposing the real politique of the executive and the legislative branches of the government and this, in turn, is opening up a new chapter, I believe, in the history of democracy in Brazil. In this panorama in flux, as progressive Chief Justice Joaquim Barbosa told me in a recent interview, quote, the judiciary represents society. During his, and I, I'm doing another justice, uh, Judge Eugenio Terra, says, I'm doing social justice one by one. Terra is in charge of all health-related lawsuits in Porto Alegre. When I issued an injunction, injunction, he told me, for the provision of cancer treatment, for example, I'm also indicting the public services which have not stepped up to meet people's demands. There's an emerging body of scholarship on right to health litigation, but most studies, interestingly, that's a whole another story, the study, the public health studies, they tend to corroborate the views of the administrators that the judiciary is overstepping its role and that judicialization generates enormous administrative and fis fiscal burdens, distorts pharmaceutical policies, widens inequality in healthcare access, and encourages irrational drug use within the public healthcare system. Yet the evidence for these claims, if one does a fine-grained analysis of these studies, is too often obscured by ideological arguments and constrained by very small samples limited geographical coverage, and with few variables examined. Most scholars have argued that the judiciary should be more concerned with the problem of limited resources and should abide by established clinical protocols. 
the constitutional right to health, they say, is a governmental mandate not to write of every individual. And throughout these works, people, their health-seeking struggles, hopes and outcomes are generally nowhere to be found. In my view, this line of critique does not account for the on-the-ground realities of patient citizens, nor does it acknowledge the political possibility that this avalanche of individual litigation represents. As the history of AIDS treatment cam access campaigns show, lawsuits for drugs may actually precede or cause public distribution. Moreover, individual demands are not simply the antithesis or, uh, uh, of a collective need. Individual experiences are often modeled by common phenomena within different communities. I'm not saying here that right to health litigation um, is a perfect process. It is costly administratively, but also humanly. But that it's rather an opportunity to ask how these citizens' demands could be politicized to attend to the diverse, urgent needs of all people. Certainly, litigation is not a substitute for health policy, but it can be a crucial adjunct and an alternative source of evidence for improving public health. Individual claims thus highlight what is not working and what is missing, making systems responsible, responsive, hopefully, and the state care. To respond uh, to the need for a people-centered knowledge of the struggles to realize the right to health, we created a database of lawsuits against the state of Rio Grande do Sul. Our data collection team had access to all medicinal lawsuits filed in 2008 against the state of Rio Grande do Sul. We systematically analyzed one of every six new lawsuits, totalizing 1,200 and uh, 62 cases in the sample, and today I want to briefly share with you a preliminary analysis that Mariana was fundamental uh, in helping us develop of this, of this database. So who is this population who, who, who sues the state of Rio Grande do Sul for medicines? Yeah, you can see a general profile of the population, a slight majority of female, you know, you can see their age, and you can also city of residence, you can see how widespread it is. It's in the capital, but also in the interior. You know, most of the cities were contemplated uh, in the sample. As far as their occupation, past research has suggested that right to health treatment in, uh, litigation in Brazil is for the most part a practice of the financially better off. But our empirical results show that this argument is part what we like to call the mythology of judicialization. Among the plaintiffs who reported their employment status, more than half were either retired or unemployed. This means very poor people. About 60% of the lawsuits were filed by, by the public defender's office, who only gives legal assistance to people who show that they earn less than three minimum wages, indicating that litigants tended to be poor and dependent on the state also to pursue their legal uh, their rights. Interestingly, 84% of the lawsuits requested medicines which were already on governmental drug formularies. They were not just asking the drugs that had just entered the market as the politicians and the public officers tend to assume. Only 16% of the cases requested exclusively medicines off the formulae, fora das listas, as was the case of Edgar. 25% of the lawsuits requested only drugs that were distributed by the healthcare system, and 59% percent of the lawsuits requesting drugs both on and off formulary. This reality challenges arguments that lawsuits basically require treatments that are individualized, costly, non-evidence-based, and ineffective, which is the official discourse of, of policymakers. The vast majority of the cases, 80 percent, indicated that treatment was requested for a continuous duration, reflecting the char character of chronic diseases that afflict patients as it got. So you start to get an impression. This is like, you know, retired, unemployed, poor, chronically ill population, which is, you know, the, the portrait of, 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 of Brazil uh, today. So these are the medicines mostly, uh, uh, most frequently requested, where generally for common problems such as asthma, hypertension, cholesterol, and mental illnesses. They were part of official drug formularies and had therapeutic protocols defined by the Ministry of Health. But most patients, interestingly, had comorbidities and required multiple medicines for their treatments. There was an average of 2.6 uh, demands of medicines per lawsuit, indicating 
question of comorbidities. Interesting, we love this slide that Mariana produced. Uh, the, um, and again, the previous slide, basically, and this, all these results show that governmental pharmaceutical programs are failing to fulfill their role of expanding access and rationalizing use, and that the poor are trying to make the system work for them via litigation. Litigants mostly sought low-cost drugs. This was a surprise when we did this analysis of the cost of the drugs. The West majority, 75% requested medicines with a monthly cost below 600 reais, about $260, as was the case of Edgar. High-cost medicines were the minority of the sample, like medicines to treat uh, like a, a metabolic disorder, genetic disease, which can cost up to $150,000, $200,000 a year per patient. You know, those are really the outliers. Very few, very few of those cases, you know. Uh, uh, only one and a half percent of the lawsuits, 24 cases, had a monthly cost above 15,000 reais, or 600, 6, 000, about $6,000. Taking together <clears throat> the medicine, as you can see, that were on then to the list or follow the list on or off the formulary, you know, up and down, you know, um, did not diverge significantly in terms of cost. In both cases, the vast majority, 75% of the demands, had a monthly value below 600 reais. In almost all the losses, and that's a striking result too, the judges granted the plaintiffs an immediate injunction demanding the state to provide the requested drugs. As you can see, full injunction, 93%, partial injunction granted, 3%, basically 100% the judges were siding with the patient litigant and explaining that this was consistent with Brazil's constitutional obligation to fulfill the right to health. All these results describe a very different picture from the official mythology that depicts judicialization as the harbinger of inequality and the antagonist of the public health system. And the final story, and I'm concluding, I want to tell you, extrapolates further and points to new social forms emerging in the interface of right health litigation, medical technology, and the state. Where institutions fail, communities articulate fragile and short-range solutions. And these solutions can teach us that social ties are often the last and best resort in the face of disregard and death. 16-year-old Leticia and nine-year-old Cacieli, and they're posing to Torvid here, are the daughters of a migrant family living in the outskirts of Porto Alegre. Both suffer from phenicetonuria, or PKU, a metabolic genetic disorder. The difference is that the younger one, Caccielli, was immediately diagnosed and treated with a combination of diet and medication. Leticia, the older, was not, and she now suffers from severe mental retardation. Leticia was only diagnosed because her younger sister was born after screening had become mandatory in Brazil, and the special baby formula needed to prevent the development of disease had become universally available in SUS via the public health system. In the state of Rio Grande do Sul, about 120 patients need this formula, but given distribution pro problems, 25 families had to file lawsuits to ensure access. We interviewed all these litigant families who for the most part live in the interior and are in fact poor. Like Marizetti and Neri, they all have low levels of formal education, but this does not prevent them or stop them from judicializing. Leticia and Caccielli's family received the formula through administrative procedures, but they also decided to file a lawsuit to obtain special food like pasta and flour, which is vastly more expensive than the common food that the sisters are allowed to eat and which took up most of the family's uh, budget. As the state failed to make the formula available, the couple also thought about judicializing it. But at the very last moment, the family decided not to because Dr. Paula Vargas, the girl's beloved physician, and other families lent them formulas until distribution resumed. As Marizetti puts it, as mães se ajudam uma a outra, mothers help each other. When one gets something, she teaches the others. So one keeps helping the other until we get it. 
In this example, the family of Leticia and Caccielli found something that they identified as more useful or preferable to judicialization, a caring and aware, and aware health professional and a social web. And here you see Dottora Paula, herself a child of Talidomai, who was said that she could never study, and she said, no, I want to be a pediatrician. And she was responsible for making the test do pezinho, the food test, which can diagnose phenocytonuria, part you know, of, of the of, uh, mandatory in, in, in the country. Rather than turning to the courts, Dr. Vargas helped to create and sustain solidarity among her patients, facilitating the sharing of the formula and mutual support among families living with PKU. When the formula is lacking, families can call me at any time, and I'm sure I can do something even when the state is not doing its job. This patient simply cannot go without treatment. It would be a crime. Right to health lawsuits give us only a partial view of the therapeutic trajectories of patients and their families, New sociomedical forms become a kind, what I like to call, para-infrastructure for access to treatment and care. Without such forms of support, Dr. Vargas says, many more would judicialize. As the cases of Edgar and Leticia and Caccielli show, the booming number of right to health lawsuits reveal both the weakness of administration and policy in Brazil, and that the judiciary is indeed, is indeed becoming a powerful purveyor of medical technology access. The needs of patients are not addressed holistically, and in spite of its universality, healthcare delivery is really stuck in an access and volume mindset, rather than focusing on the value delivered to patient, or what Professor Ayres would say, care. Let me conclude. These new patient citizen consumers that I introduced uh, to you, <laughs> and thousands of others like Christina, who wanted to tell her story, but she was afraid that by showing her face, the state might not deliver <laughs> the insulin pump that she had won in court, in court, find their way into the judiciary reluctantly, tinkering with available human and material resources. There is a productive open source anarchy at work in the healthcare field in this country, and in the, which is in the midst of striking challenges, changes and challenges. The judicialization of health has become, as I said, a para infrastructure in which the chronically ill and various public and private actors and sectors come into contact, face off, and enact one by one rescue missions. This minimum biopolitical belonging, to use, uh, to bring back Fernanda's concern with the biopolitical, is part and parcel of the imminent field people invent to live in and by as they navigate the vagaries of the market and inclusion and survival in wounded cities. As a right to pharmaceuticals is consolidated in Brazil, the various branches of government have yet to develop a systematic approach to tackling drug costs and financing, nor have they determined the responsibilities of the private health insurance plans in covering drug costs and medical services. As judges keep responding to individual cases, the judiciary should foster health as a collective right and pursue strategies to measure and ensure universal availability of medicines that the government has a legal responsibility to provide. Local governments should certainly track court cases and use them to inform efforts to remedy specific disease policies and administrative shortcomings and public health budgetary planning. Civil society currently engaged in seeking medicines should also press governments to improve public health infrastructures. And maybe this is happening through the movements, you know, that we saw emerging uh, as, of, as of last summer in Brazil, and to address health and human rights broadly. Until more fundamental changes are realized, Brazil should ensure the adequate delivery of essential medicines and increase the transparency and efficiency with which new medicines are evaluated for inclusion or not in, the dr in new drug, uh, in drug formularies. As for our understanding of the ever-growing and complex judicialization of the right to health, I believe that field work has much to contribute and that ethnography can work as an early warning system. People on the ground recognize what is troubling them. And it is there that our critical work should begin. Ethnographers are uniquely positioned to see what more categorically minded experts may overlook, namely the empirical evidence that emerges when people express their most pressing and ordinary concerns, which then open up onto complex human stories in time and space we should be the center of public debate and action. Thank you. Uh, 
I have to thank yes, everyone, uh, to thank João, uh, to thank Bruno, uh, to thank Marcelo, uh, who are the leading organizers of this uh, special meeting, but also Pedro uh, and Lili, here, and Antonio Sergio, who have been uh, running this network uh, for the last three years, I guess. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, I was quite uh, concerned when João uh, first asked me to present something here because I do nothing on health. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not a researcher on cities. And uh, uh, actually, I, I was more and more uh, doing something on care. And he, he told, uh uh, that's it. You should do this. Uh, then, uh, actually, uh, what I'm going to, to try to, uh, to show you uh, is um, some, I think, interesting results uh, taking the care issue uh, from another point of view, uh, observing the care workers. <coughs> and uh, and uh, I try to begin uh, with the question uh, João put for this section. What are care, health and care today? And I began thinking, what is really care today in Brazil? Uh, I take advantage for uh, your presentation, Zé Ricardo, which was great, and put some historical important elements in terms of institutional uh, fight for, uh, for care, protection, welfare in Brazil. Uh, but I, I, I would take a, a very special Avenue, uh, thinking about uh, a sort of uh, of care work uh, that has been uh, providing in Brazil, has been growing in Brazil, and uh, that perhaps we can summarize it around uh, one word: cuidador, cuidadora, care worker, carer, uh, and. Uh, since I think that work, words can tell us much more than sometimes we, we suppose, I try to, to think uh, that actually care cuidadores, and I discovered this when I was planning the paper Caroline has with her, uh, and uh, discussing with my Japanese partner, Kurumi Sugita, she told, you know, uh, we have a new word for the worker uh, that does this, that performs this work, which is kaigo. And I thought, actually in Brazil too, it's, it sounds, or at least it sounded quite bizarre, the word cuidadora for us in Brazil some 10 years ago. Huh? And it became more and more familiar huh, in our daily life. Everyone knows anyone who has or had or had someone who had a cuidadora taking care of an elderly or a dependent, mostly person. So I thought, but it's interesting because the, the word cuidado has a long history. Huh? Care, huh? cuidado, tomar cuidado, cuidar de, uh, in Portuguese, is something gendered. Uh, something related to women's activities. So I thought, if I try to track this, what could be the result? And the result is this. This is Estado de São Paulo. Uh, I tried to search uh, for the record cuidador, or cuidadora, because at this point of the time, I knew mostly were women. So it could change. And summing up, cuidador and cuidadora, uh, I, I think I got this new, recent, present face of the care problem in Brazil. It's amazing how uh, ah, sorry. the references, are, the records, are mostly coming from 1875 to 2014 they are almost all concentrated in the last two decades. And if there is some reference uh, to the word cuidador, 
I try to track what, what kind of reference uh, are there, are those in the 60s, in the, s oh. mm -hmm. in the 60s, in the 70s. They all refer to men's work uh, related to caring horses, mm -hmm. caring <laughs> animals. <laughs> no? So uh, uh, news on the Estado de São Paulo, on horses competitions, and the cuidadores. So there is, it looks like if there is something really new, huh? something new. Gendered, yes, it is gendered. I tried to, uh, to separate cuidador from cuidadora. Huh? And it's e also interesting. You can see the, the, the horse cares, <laughs> they are all male. Huh? This, this uh, is the computer who decided to, to, to put on pink cuidadores <laughs> in the blue cuidadores, not me, it's great. But this pink cuidadora in the 70s, it's, it's great, the, 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 the record in the Estado de São Paulo, it's a Swedish woman who was uh, a, at the same time uh, jockey, how do you say, ride r horses on competitions and a cuidadora, which was so exceptional so exceptional that it took a large uh, uh, reference in the study of São Paulo. But to, to go faster, uh, you can see that it's gendered, no? uh, but it's gendered in a different way we were expecting when we talk about care work. No? Uh, there is a lot of men, but it's interesting because when we move from the 20s to the 20s, then uh, women improve a lot its weight uh, in the, their weight in in this in this occupation of course it is related it's related to the aging process of uh, Brazilian population I, I take advantage of this comparative paper I, I almost nothing refer Caroline here I escape and say other things uh, and we can see that uh, the, the, the the precise time where records appears in the Estado de São Paulo is the time where the aging process is increasing in Brazil. Huh? We have precisely this move, this change in the, in the slope of the curve huh? at the same time where records appeared in the Estado de São Paulo. Huh? So it's related to aging. It's also relating to, to a, a commodification process which is very fast in gendered in Brazil. This is uh, changing from the 60s to 2010 census data in Brazil, participation rates uh, by sex. Those are men and those are women. We know there is a commodification process in the sense that people go to the market to get survival. It was not usual very recently in the 60s most people did not go even having the age to be there socially expected to be there they weren't in the market they were outside the market getting survival and there are almost female that sustained this commodification move uh, and the result is an important increase in terms of uh, those occupations as those related to giving, providing care. Uh, I have no time to compare the different types of workers, but I just will call your attention to this blue line. Uh, in this blue line are those traditional care workers taking care of elderly and uh, uh, children. <coughs> uh, and this uh, is the mean, the other occupied employees. Uh, and more interesting, uh, this blue, other blue uh, line, is the rate of growth of regularly, regularly domestic employed, maid, nannies, etc., classified as that, just to, to, to perceive the, the growth. No? Uh, and you see, uh, there is a, 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 a time, a sort of time combination, so, that explosion of the word cuidadora, no? in the scene, in the public conversation, is strongly, closely related 
with the growing presence of women in, in the labor market, with the growing uh, aging in the population, with the amplifying uh, uh, presence of, of professional workers. And I, I think this is a, 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 an important point. And, and I took some, uh, some, uh, some pictures from the, uh, from the newspaper. It, it, it's interesting. Uh, probably we Brazilians, we, we feel we never think uh, systematically on this. But the, there is a move uh, getting out domestic labor paid domestic labor, uh, domestic employment. And women more and more uh, prefer, instead of, of being uh, working for other women in their house, uh, doing nails or taking care in the limit. What they did was care. So they can do this as professional care. There is no barriers in terms of vocational training as there are in other countries. This comparative study with uh, France and Japan shows this. There is not the case in Brazil. So it's easy to jump, to escape to another free, uh, more recognized uh, world as worker. Huh? And uh, this is a very interesting story from a woman that came from Bahia, but uh, we have no time to, to go on this. What is interesting? Uh, this is not only an individual, I, and I get back to the, the end of Joan's uh, talk, which uh, was great. There is not only an individual move, but it becomes more and more a collective move. I mean, the more women, also men, but overall women, move from the private, bad paid, unregistered domestic employment toward professional care as cuidadora, huh? the more individually, huh, as a way to escape, to be recognized, having another label, not so much domestic, so much cuidadora, huh? uh, although I do the same thing, huh? the more this move goes on, the more uh, the move toward asking for rights improves. Hmm? So, uh, in 2002, uh, form, form of Brazilian uh, occupational classification recognizes cuidadora as an occupation. Uh, and almost immediately it echoes in terms of rights demands. Huh? And uh, in 2012, uh, uh, I don't know how to say it in English, uh, Projeto Legislativo, uh, a project on the, on the, on the Congress uh, began uh, asking for professional regulation uh, for those cuidadores, those in general home carers, professional home carers. What is very interesting is that at the, at, in the time that, that that project began running in the Congress, nurses and other carers, professional carers, but with uh, an unquestionable status, uh, resisted, begin to resist. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the health community, uh, the health care community, begin to resist. This is, uh, this is something I got from, uh, from uh, I don't know what is this, I, I think it's, it's not a regular newspaper mm -hmm. from the, the nurses, uh, Union, but uh, some, almost this, uh, where they organize a whole set of arguments against against the professional regulation. Not only uh, the cuidadores, but from parteiras, uh, from uh, terapeutas, uh, a new set of occupations that are coming to the public spheres. They have becoming more and more named <coughs> and whose workers ask for rights. This <coughs> estrangement is broadened. It's not only a, a, a tension between profession, professionals <coughs> inside a field, but it's broader than this. Uh, there is a, a sort of social estrangement 
very interesting. I took two, uh, two records from Estado de São Paulo, from the, the whole set of records I, I referred at the beginning. Uh, one uh, named Pacote de Bondades. I don't know how to translate pacote de bondades with yeah, all the irony it, 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 it has. <laughs> Como? Package of goodness. Hey, with a lot of irony on it. <laughs> and uh, in this, uh, in this uh, pacote de bondades, package of, uh, of goodness, uh, the Estado uh, de São Paulo says uh, part of this package goes to cuidadores. Uh, care workers, uh, and it refers, categoria cujo nome poucos conhecem, mereceu atenção do deputado Otávio Leite, PSDB, Rio de Janeiro, profissional responsável por cuidar de pessoa doente ou dependente, não poderá receber menos que 765 uh, reais. Cuidador, care worker, is referred as a category whose name few know. Uh, and uh, this is 2010. Uh, 2011, uh, there is an editorial in the state of São Paulo named uh, uh, "Professional Regulation," telling uh, th they are running uh, in the in the Congress 45 uh, projects uh, providing professional regulation to a list of the most prepos preposterous professions. <laughs> and it, here comes the list. Huh? In heading the list. Uh, elder care uh, care worker uh, and again others I don't know how to translate lutador de artes marciais mistas bugreiro, totally Brazilian guarda de gurita uh, uh, really uh, preposterous professions uh, oh what happened to me oh sorry Returning to the words, uh, I, I keep thinking about the words because all about like this, cuidado is something really present in our language, ordinary language. And I, I went to study with São Paulo, 1875 to 1910, and searched for uh, the records on the word cuidado. And you can see how it is completely different. Huh? Cuidado is something that care is something that has been socially important and has been socially phrased, named, and has been appeared in, in the press uh, for more than uh, almost a hundred years. More than a hundred years. If we compare the proportion of references, uh, the absolute Sorry, not proportion. And I put absolute to be uh, uh, clear on this, on the word cuidado. In the references on the word cuidador plus cuidadora, the difference is really huge. In a graph like this, we, al we almost don't see, can't see uh, the numbers uh, that express the reference, the records to uh, cuidadora or cuidador. Uh, I mean, this is a this is something present, but something, and this is new, that <coughs> recently has been done by especially professionalized people with different kind of of, of skilling, vocational training, levels of training, and social recognition. Uh, but uh, but present, and strongly present. Uh, in the last two decades. This is new in a very old problem. Uh, a very old problem that uh, uh, in general literature, it's interesting when we try to trace uh, how new this is in, for Brazilian Academy, our papers on this from sociology and anthropology, uh, taking care workers uh, in this sense, in care, ethic of care, <coughs> gender and care, but professional care in perspective are very recent. They are also, uh, they have also the same concentration as the word cuidado e cuidadoras has. 
This is not the case when we compare the United States. We have classical works from the 80s, uh, Toronto, uh, Gillian. Uh, if we compare uh, with France, we have important words, uh, works sorry, uh, from the 2000s. Uh, but this is recent for us as, uh, as an analytical question. Uh, in, in, in general, when we, when we look at this in, in broader terms, and I, I run on this because uh, José Ricardo made my, my service, uh, uh, you have the, uh, a combination of different actors that you have to have in mind. Uh, of course, the care recipient, but the family, which can be m more or less important depending on the society, uh, the market, uh, the voluntary sector, which depending on the kind of, of care, it can be very important. In Brazil, care for, for children has been for a long time something uh, absorbed by, by voluntary sector, and the public sector. Huh? And, and the, the way those agents interconnect pro, uh, uh, produce different modes of care provision. And it's, if, if we move from the individual to the institutional, broader uh, uh, panorama, uh, it's important to see how they interconnect. I, in the paper, I, I, I go further on this, I, I, I'll just show three different national ways of interconnecting those uh, five, uh, five agents. This is France. Uh, here we, we try to, to, to think using Glucksmann uh, ideas. Uh, developed originally to compare England and the Netherlands and Sweden, uh, to compare France, Japan, and, and Brazil. Uh, uh, you can see who provides and who uh, support, financially support the care. Uh, and just if I move the pictures, you can see how the, the, the arrangement can change. This is France, with high importance of the state. This is Japan, it's another configuration. I don't have time to develop how the configuration operates, but just to show how the combination changes. No? And this is Brazil. No? And the most striking thing in Brazil is if there is market, and there is more and more market, market can have different, uh, different phases. Market can be uh, uh, long-term institutions, uh, private long-term institutions, uh, but market is overall domestic workers and home cares, which have a very, uh, a very fragile, a very blurred frontier uh, with the traditional maid. Huh? And this, for me, was the interesting thing to observe when it takes off care and care work in Brazil. In this dispute of, around the right of being named as carer, as professional care worker, what pro probably is in the background is that, uh, that overlapping between the public, professional, uh, uh, recognized work of care and the private, bad paid, almost never recognized, uh, care work, either done uh, by the housewife, but less and less done by her, more and more done by the former maid, but now for the cuidadora. Hmm? This mix of maid and profession. I tried to compare very, very fast, nah? to show that frontiers and then profiles are very, very slight, very, very blurred nah? when it takes uh, for home care workers, caring elderly and children, and domestic workers like maids and, 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 and the others. Uh, sorry for, for it is in Portuguese, I'll try. Uh, the most important here is try to compare the, this line, the first one, where I show data for care workers taking care of elders and children. This is Brazil. This is Brazil 2009, and you understand later on uh, why it's 2009. And the other domestic workers, the other domestic workers. Hmm? So they are almost women. Huh? And there is nothing uh, 
important in terms of difference between the mean other domestic workers and the care workers. Huh? They are slightly more black. Huh? Uh, we find slightly more white care workers than other domestic workers. They are slightly more educated. There is less, uh, no degree, even no fundamental degree uh, among the care workers than among the other domestics. And they are a little less educated, a little more educated in terms of intermediary degree. They are younger for the whole of nannies uh, here. Uh, they have a, a, a still more intense labor work more than 48 hours is more usual among care workers than among uh, regular domestic workers. And they are as bad paid as the others. Less than one minimum wage, 52% of care workers own. 48 domestic workers. Uh, and that's unprotected. Working without formal contracts, 72% of care workers 49% of regular domestic workers. So, uh, to jump to, 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 to conclude, uh, uh, my idea is under so blurred frontiers, what can we say about sense of belonging uh, or professional identities? Uh, I use uh, the data in an uh, in, uh, unexpected way. Uh, generally, we use uh, statistics from occupational position uh, agreeing with the way uh, technicals in the uh, in the institutes classify people and not asking how people describe again words their uh, the, the work they perform what I did I selected for São Paulo which is the most important market uh, for care work in Brazil for 2009 that's why the other statistics were for 2009 uh, the records in the field the interviewers took when there is a ordinary question, could you describe please your occupation? Using this description in the office, we classify. And we researchers analyze the classification already done. I did a step back and I went to the words used to describe. No? But I did this for a subsample uh, this is research on employment and unemployment, the household research for metropolitan region of Sao Paulo. I selected on this research a subgroup of people that with no doubt would be classified for us academics as care workers. And I got back to the files to see what they used as words to describe their own words. What is really interesting is that only, only 23% referred the work they performed as a work, the cuidadores, as care work. 73% referred uh, using words that describe domestic, regular domestic work. I cleaned the house, I washed, washed the clothes for the elder, but for her, it was domestic, regular domestic work. Uh, who refers her own work as cuidadora, hmm? I'll be very fair. the more educated, the best paid, and the more white. Just to finish, huh? uh, what happens then when rights come in an unattended political form or in an unattended political way? The picture I, 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 I portrayed in the beginning was there is an occupation uh, that is growing. Uh, the more and more uh, old domestic servants move toward uh, household care, uh, and they ask for rights. But, and they, they went to the Congress, huh? but unexpectedly, in April 2013, a constitutional amendment has been approved to protect domestic workers. In Brazil, in an ironic, highly discriminatory way, we use it to call a PEC das domésticas. No? And it is not the, the constitutional amend for the maids, but it is the constitutional <coughs> amendment for domestic workers. 
And this is very interesting because this is new. Uh, the house now is something totally different. The house was 20 or 30 years ago. There's a different set of people there. Huh? There are cuidadores, uh, there are domestic servants, uh, there is the housewife. Uh, th there's a whole set of new characters, uh, characters in the house. Huh? And you shall, you shall protect domestic workers. Then rights arrived for them, classifying them with the label. They refused to use up to this moment. Hmm? In, 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 in my eyes, uh, did this, the, oh, wh where belonging uh, will be. Huh? Uh, those people will, will belong, we will accept to belong to the set of domestic uh, workers. Huh? Uh, the press, uh, there was a huge debate in the press on this. <coughs> huh? Now we are going to be like Europe, uh, uh, this is the hell, uh, the other side, no, uh, women are not uh, employers, uh, this is uh, class fight. I, I don't go back to this, but overall we know this changed the market for uh, household care, professional care. In this put another thing, this is very interesting, this Felipe da Silva, and I, I finish with this, Felipe da Silva appears saying, you know, I accept. I prefer to be domestic worker. And I enter na justiça. <coughs> uh, I enter the justice for my rights. Because uh, overall, my salary mm -hmm. was, was not the one I should have been receiving. Uh, my, my, my hours were not the ones I should have been working, etc., etc., etc. So final remarks. There has been an important institutional movement in Brazil toward growing protections and right regulation. Uh, uh, this is evident. But I think when you take this care workers' perspectives, we clearly see that this is not enough. Uh, observing care work, I, I think it reveals important changes, either in women labor, uh, labor commodification, care commodification, new actors in the household, but whenever inequalities, either material and symbolic, remain important feature, and in Brazil it remains, negotiating new identities become a long and torturous process, challenges sense of belonging and professional, either individual or collective identities. Thank you. I don't actually have a prepared statement, just some comments and then some questions. Mm -hmm. So um, there are about four social scientists who have written books on sickle cell disease, and two of them happen to work at Princeton University. <laughs> <laughs> so you saw this speech by Keith yesterday, and um, so I'm another one. And um, so my comments come from my own research, and I just want to sort of preface some things that I noted in my own research, and then I'll build the questions off of those. So, I was really interested in this question about how you create social justice um, around uh, healthcare disparities. So what constitutes social justice in the clinic? And I was very interested in the health advocacy that was being done by the sickle cell associations. I was very interested in what the doctors were doing in the hospitals to kind of open up space and access for healthcare um, in the clinics. I was interested at the national level what scientists were doing in order to articulate kinds of new ways of thinking about disease in order to, again, open up space through um, regimes, biomedical re regimes. And uh, I came into my field work thinking that I was going to be able to easily locate racism. I thought that I was going to think that evidence-based medicine was going to be a wonderful approach that was going to open up and equalize healthcare access. Um, and I also thought that more healthcare access was better than anything. And all of those presumptions fell apart um, within a few years of doing field work. Uh, race was not easy, e easy to locate. It's a very complicated thing. It's euph uh, euphemized. You know, there's euphemisms all over the place for what constitutes race. Um, doctors deployed in very particular ways to provide access or, or, or deny access. Um, and so it's very complicated. I was also working with a group of physicians who were very committed to social justice. I mean, they, are, they chose to focus on sickle cell disease, which is a rare thing. It's not a high status uh, sort of <coughs> focus. Uh, and uh, so you, I, I was meeting people from Israel and Lebanon and these physicians 
from all over the world and white and white physicians, or white physicians in Indiana, who just fell in love with hematology and fell in love with sickle cell disease. But as a result, they became sort of in the forefront of trying to change hospital practices to open up access. Um, and they did it again through this kind of evidence-based approach, but then evidence-based is very complicated in the case of sickle cell disease. What, I'm not sure what we're looking at. Um, so I don't want to get too deeply into my own work. Um, I just note it because I'm going to make a, a few comments. One, I'm going to talk about the city. Bruno opened up with this wonderful comment about um, cities and the ways in which we've separated work from home and, and process health has become sort of segregated into some kind of uh, hospital uh, that's away from other people's work. And I think that that's a really important thing that I noted, which is that there's another problem with the hospital too, which is that professional doctors have particular obligations, and this is directed at you, Jose, which is they, you know, you, you drew the, 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 the diagram of the technocratic science, technoscientific knowledge, and kind of the intersubjectivity, but um, it, it's, it was fascinating to me how patients didn't chose not to go to the hospital, but chose to go to local associations because if they reported anything to their doctors, their doctors had particular kinds of reporting obligations. And if they wanted to do anything experimental, they didn't want to tell their doctors either because they were afraid the doctors would reject it or they would think that they were irrational and they would do other sorts of other things as a result of that. So I wanted to know what's the space of the profession in this such that it limits the abilities of doctors to actually really be able to do and work with patients in the way they want to be uh, to want to work with and live their lives. Um, so I'm sort of interested in that question of risk. Um, where's, where is risk in all of this? How is risk negotiated? Um, and where is the space of the profession with respect to risk? Because in the United States, doctors can't take particular risks because they could be, you know, they lose their license um, and other sorts of things. So I was wondering, you know, I don't know in Brazil what happens, but at least here that's an important thing. Um, and with respect to Zhuo, uh, this is, I mean, first of all, these are all wonderful papers and they really did there was a lot of synergy here. Joao, with respect to um, this incredible work with a number of scholars, you know, there's this uh, discussion and development about this kind of constantly moving goalpost. You know, what's the limits of development? When, is, when, is, when are you developed? You know, when can we stop? You know, when we, you know, we take a break and enjoy what we have? And I guess <laughs> I, I wonder sometimes, what's the limit? Where are we going with this? Um, and I think it's wonderful uh, that these people are consumers, but again, um, consumers and professionalization are two separate things and, and in tension with one another. Um, but I did find it was interesting that they really are only adjudicating over um, quote unquote, ev evidence-based treatments. They're not adjudicating, they don't seem to be adjudicating beyond that. So there also seems to be some limits that they put on themselves with respect to how much they're demanding from the state. Um, you know, in the United States, there are all sorts of reasons why people don't make particular demands for medical care, and they're all rooted in history and, and identities, political identities and uh, everything else. But I'd be interested to know what in, in Brazil keeps people from fighting beyond this, because they have imposed their own limits. And then this, with respect to care, I mean, I keep returning to the professionalization thing, but I, uh, you know, it, it was interesting because I read this paper, and it's a little different. <laughs> uh, but I was thinking about, you know, what what kind of um, analogies do we use to think about this domestic care worker? Um, I was thinking about cats, work on cats, because a lot of there's a lot of weird abjection. Um, it's bizarre that. Um, Healthcare in the hospital is valorized, but healthcare in the domestic space is devalorized. Um, and so, I wanted to ask you, you know, in your in your research, if there's um, if you think professionalization is a good idea, because again, getting back to Bruno's point, professionalization means that um, you're not free to do a lot of things that you you know you you have. People looking over your shoulder all the time. It's harder to decentralize. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if you're thinking about the role of licensing and the role of oversight as a necessarily a good thing in this context or a bad thing. So.
we're running out of time, so I would suggest we take a round of questions. But, but you know we have time. We do have time. Remember, remember last year we have time. So you, you we can take a bit more. Do you prefer to? No, no. I think you can come back and okay. Can and I, I'm not supposed to raise any questions, so I will not ask you, Jean, uh, about <laughs> the role uh, photography plays in yes. your <laughs> engaged in shops, you know, 24 de, ma de mars, you know, when, when they work in, in places like that. Uh, avoiding, even uh, if they earn less than being a maid, they avoid the label of being a maid. Because domestic work itself is seen as invisible, devalued, you know, uh, feminine work. Uh, there's also a, 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 a gender issue here. I don't know if you want to comment a little more. question for Joel um, as well and I was thinking because this problem of judicialization of, of health um, rights is very common in Colombia and has been talked about it um, in, in basically in the terms that you describe it by economists and policymakers um, as, a, as a, a kind of a burden for the, for the system and also kind of resonates with the comment that you had made before because uh, I was wondering to what extent I guess then let me rephrase a bit because Colombia does not have like the same public system in terms of health provision that Brazil has. So it, in what I was thinking is then what what are we associating these two? Because it, it does not have to be necessarily with the public private uh, provision of health, but it might be something else. And I was wondering if you had any ideas of what is the actual kind of what it, what is the problem that we're facing. Um, um, that requires judicialization of justice that is not necessarily meant for provision of help by the state. And something that also kind of caught my attention and that um, is just sometimes we um, <coughs> tend to think that it's like what, what your research shows, I guess, or part of what it shows is that uh, there's, a, there's a lot of power in kind of social networks and that public policy cannot necessarily go through the state but there's different different other mechanisms through which we can think of public works that are not uh, going through the state. And I don't know if that is something that you would like to explore or just what you're aiming at is pressing more for state action. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I kind of another one round well, thank you very much for the papers. Uh, I really um, uh, appreciate uh, this uh, very stimulating discussion. 
I have a question, um, a comment and a question for for Joao and Nadia, uh, because it seemed to me that there is uh, uh, something quite fascinating here. Uh, Joao uh, stressed the fact that the poor were sort of in alliance with the profession, professionals, like the judges. It struck me in a sort of Hirschmannian way, getting ahead collectively requires uh, requires this kind of alliance uh, in between different social classes sometimes, the poor and the judges in this case. And I found that very interesting. And to a certain extent in Nadia's discussion, fascinating to talk to what's in a word, no? what's in a name. Uh, but also uh, the state uh, plays a very important role uh, here. We're not talking about, of course, revolution, not even rebellion. We're talking about getting ahead collectively. Uh, requires allies, strong allies. And uh, I have a question. Of course, very different. The, the US implicitly is here. Uh, waiting for the comparison that's uh, uh, too huge. Uh. Thank you. Uh, it's just, I was curious, Joao, uh, if uh, when you presented that uh, characterization of the case, if in this sample, if in this process you worked, if there were some one who, was, who is convicted, you know, people that are inside the prison system that are enormous in Brazil, we have a very big imprisoned population that are very sick also with chronic diseases and you know, lots of diseases. And in what, uh, uh, if you have an idea if they are also being included in this? Uh, like yes, yes, the prisoners. You know. There are some some process that involve the fight for the rights of those in prison to have the education, or if they are being out of this. And thinking about this, this other thing you mentioned that the the law women said that here we are a judicial hospital, and then I thought the implication of this to for us to think the concept of comprehensiveness that goes beyond the the, the health system. And, and Andrea, I was also uh, thinking about those, you mentioned in the end of your presentation that the houses changed in Brazil, and the, the homes are not the same regarding this pack of the domestics and that regulates domestic works. And, and I think that these changes is coming on all over the years, uh, the, the last years, and involves all the family and the, fa the family relations. Uh, with the, the issue of family violence playing a very important role in this, in this chain. We have the Play Maria de Pena, we have the Play regulating the use of violence against Which is a lot to protect women from, uh, from uh, domestic uh, violence. Yeah. I was curious if you, if you know if the way these cuidadores appear in the media is in some extent brings uh, reflects these changes in the, not only the house, but in the family, the, the family as, a, 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 as being regulated by this public process. I don't know if you can get the idea. The, the, the <laughs> We just have Marcia so listed, so I think you can ask okay. a question. Uh, Marcia Mariano. 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 Um, <laughs> so okay, we can have a I'm, I'm working with a lawyer from Rio mm -hmm. who is looking at this issue but from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And what she's looking at is the lack of actions to claim for sanitation. Mm -hmm. And interesting enough, sanitation is not considered health, which really puzzled me. Um, and I didn't know about it. I'm learning this uh, with her. So I, I think. It, and this is a suggestion, and I can put the two in touch, but it would be interesting to see what is driving this, which is relatively recent. And why are people not seeing sanitation? It, this is a fundamental right, but they're not fighting for it. Mm -hmm. You guys are taking notes. We have two more questions. Yeah, no, it's good. Okay, so, Marty. It's just one question for as well. One of the things that struck me when I was doing my field work in, in Rio's favelas, in the early 2000s was how the program in Saúde da Família um, actually got the state into areas like Vilso Abelas where you had drug wars going on and all this 
And actually, some of, some of the most interesting field work I did was at walking around with the agents of this program. So I, I was wondering if, if something like this, because it's on a national scale, if it has anything to do with this construction of this perception of health as a right, of, or of medicine, medication as this right, given that you know the state delivers actually med medication in, in areas as difficult to do that as a real small mail is. When you show us that picture that when we saw that we have more women that ask for judicialization than men, mm -hmm. uh, how do you deal with families? Because the village that you showed us, most of them are in families, so how can you recognize if it's a woman or a man? That's or if you could use the idea of family in our picture, for example.
I don't mind this patient with uh, Don Quixote because I think uh, care is a, an utopic concept. And one of the, the problems we have to achieve is in the cognitive practices are the, the central role that uh, physicians play in the, the whole system and some important barriers in, in having these this social subjects, the physicians as, as a group, a social group, to adhere to this this kind of, of perspective, and the, the obstacle of, of I think that the, uh, among others there are two important obstacles. One is the the way that the professional uh, practice of medicine in Brazil has been uh, more and more um, salariado, as, uh, paid, paid, yeah. paid as, a, as, a, as a kind of. Uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, work in a, in, a, in, a, in a big structure where the, the professional has very uh, small uh, power to decide what to do and how to do. For instance, uh, we, we have uh, a form of paying for services by SUS that is uh, hugely uh, based upon the number of consultations the, the physicians do. So the more they do in, in medium 16 uh, consultations attendance in a, in a four hour period, so it's, it's hard to do care <laughs> in these conditions. This one, one that the other is symbolic, because uh, as I try to, to show in the diagram, it, it uh, indicates a, a change of the, 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 the power of technical science in defining the object of, of of actual intervention. And physicians don't want to lose this power. It's very difficult to, to, to join the decisions with other kinds of, of knowledge that are no uh, medical knowledge. This is, is, is very important. But I think that, on the other hand, the, the, the privilege of the uh, primary health care attention in Brazilian health policies are changing this. Because the, the teams at Saúde da Família, Health Family, uh, they are somehow um, dividing the power of decision of acting uh, with other members of the, the, the health teams, the nurse, the, the, the community of the agents. So this is uh, kind of producing tensions that I think would be good for the, the construction of a new way of, of practicing health and uh, so approaching this uh, to care. Uh, the, kind, the, the, the question about uh, justice and comprehensiveness, uh, it's also uh, very contradictory because uh, sometimes the, the judicialization of health is, is uh, being an obstacle to, to care for uh, sometimes people who, are, who, who, who is in charge of, of administration of, of health services and, and, and governments are so pressed by judicial uh, questions that they are not able to make uh, a health policy that could in fact and focus on citizenship and health relationships. They are always trying to respond to consumers' needs. And this is a, it's a tension. Uh, but on the, other hand, on the other hand, we have the, the experience of AIDS epidemic in Brazil. And uh, is it the AIDS problem in Brazil? Maybe it's the, the, one, uh, the one where the comprehensiveness is, is more deeply developed in, in health practices. And for the establishment of, of health uh, AIDS program in Brazil had in the, in the fighting justice by the right to have access to, to medicines, a very important uh, milestone, a very important uh, mm -hmm. So uh, I think that the, one of the big challenges is to, uh, something that was said here, to try to, to make the, the, the right sense uh, not uh, be so so linked to to, to a consumer right, but a citizen right, and this this 
uh, has to, to be with the question of, of Marcia. Uh, people do not see the, the justice as uh, uh, a special uh, place to, to fight for their rights as citizens, but as consumers. The health needs and demands in a totality of, 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 of uh, contextual uh, moment that makes different uh, instrumental uh, diagnosis, medicines needed or not, needed in, in some way or not, uh, including that of uh, what to prevent, how to prevent. And this requires of us uh, what I have been calling a hermeneutic uh, task for health practices to use these different categories like gender, race, uh, age, like forms of interpreting contexts, people, populations, and being uh, very critical in terms of doing this as uh, changing realities. Uh, vulnerability, uh, in fact, is now being used in the same way that we criticize the in-risk use in the of epidemics. It is, uh, People used to say uh, women or, or sex workers or men, sex men as vulnerable populations. <laughs> and I say, uh, and I'm trying to, to discuss in Brazil that we must try to not use the term vulnerable populations, but vulnerable relations or vulnerable, vulnerabilizing uh, <laughs> this word, this relationships. For us to understand the vulnerability as a result of our social practice, and at the same time we do this, we are uh, immediately transforming these practices. So uh, I agree with you that we we, we have to be, we have to have a, a, a critical surveillance <laughs> uh, in, the, in the in the construction of our responses to not do the same thing with the vulnerability that had played a very important role to resist to, to the, the essentialism of, of risk categories and uh, don't form the same uh, idea. Okay, trap. 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 Okay, guys, I will not keep you long. Thank you so much for your comments. It was great to hear the colleagues speak and your questions. And the idea is to have the questions to inform what comes next. You're yeah. absolutely right, Karen. So, so when do we reach that moment, the plateau, right, where, where something has been achieved and we can just, you know, we, we don't want more or we don't criticize what's what's lacking. And, and I think the question of the of the object and the limits of the right to health is a crucial question that all branches of government are reckoning with. And and people, as they feel more as subjects of rights, they are also dealing with: is it my right to, you know, to surgery? Is it my right to you know, to, to get the treatment or to get a brand drug, or, you know, it's, it's a complicated issue. And I think the press, the fact that the, the Constitution mm -hmm. enshrined the right to health in such broad terms, right, not just universal in terms of equity, in terms of comprehensiveness, you know, and this will, will not be rewritten most likely. So, so, so my point is more like, so we have this open source energy for better, for worse. This is our world now, you know, but it's no longer an ideal world, you know, there are many players. And it has been changed with, uh, you know, with the with the state also presenting itself as a provider of technology in lieu of infrastructural reforms, you know. And in some ways, it has it has changed somehow the game of the citizen, not just, you know, being the infectious citizen or the one that can be prevented. The citizen wants to be cared for now, and the citizen many times gets the information not from, you know, from the state or public health, gets from the pharmaceutical industry, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a very, so in some ways what I'm suggesting, we have a, an ambiguous political subject here who is making different demands, you know, on state institutions to access state institutions' welfare care, but also to access the commodities of the market. But the state itself is casting its own welfare or its own healthcare system in market terms, you know, reimbursements, etc. Et so the state is also privatizing its the delivery of care. So it goes both ways. So somehow I'm just trying to say these are not just the malingerers of the system, you know, they are in fact, in my view, in our work, in practice what we see, they are trying to make things work on the ground, you know. And it's a, it, so in that sense I think I will, I'll get to the question of, of, of archive, which is the question of of, uh, of how you move ahead collectively. You're absolutely right. In this case, the litigants are teaming up with the public defender and with the judge. 
But when we began the study of the public defender's office, the public defenders had, a, had an enmity with the judge. They, they fantasized that the judge would not support them. But in the process, they realized that the judge wanted <laughs> to support the cause, but they need to have the clear evidence-based uh, protocol or claim. You know? So now they work together, the public defender and the judge, to make sure that some bulletproof claim in Puerto Alegre. And the public defenders, you know, thinking of the legal system, they want to become political subjects, political actors with some voice. From Sao Paulo is always shown as an example. Sao Paulo was, I think, the last country, the last state, is a country, within a country, <laughs> the last state to have public defenders, you know, uh, in Brazil. So, it's so people say, oh, but people are not judicializing here, or, or only the rich are judicializing, you know. But th there, were, there were not really that many channels to this. We went to still have a very advanced, you know, uh, public defender's office, but they also are counting what has become of the other tool of the system, which is the public ministry, the Ministerio Publico, which is really not doing necessarily its job. The public ministry could do collective causes, you know, the, with vulnerable, ca vulnerable groups, you know, children, you know, the elderly. So the public defender's office is a bit overwhelmed <coughs> in doing this one by one litigation. Also, with then the issue of access to to rooms. Uh, for uh, psychiatric treatment or drug rehabilitation, you know. So they are doing some kind of institutional collective causes, but on that, it's not getting to that level, as you said, of, of, of sanitation, which is absolutely uh, 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 a crucial one. The comparison with Colombia is fantastic, you know, also with South Africa, with India. So the judiciary is playing different roles, but it's playing a role in public health in these various contexts, in different, 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 different levels. We can talk more uh, about it later. Um, as for the question, do you ask about the family? All of those patient lead events, they have to have some form of collective, and someone in their family has to help them. Without a family member stopping working and making judicialization their job, they will not work. You don't have a religious community, so I call those like temporary collectives, you know, fragile. Temp but these are, these are the social movements of now. So we cannot just idealize that the change will only happen through how we imagined civil society and social movements in the 90s, and I will stop here. Because when we talk to activists from HIV AIDS, you know, they say, oh, these new, these groups, the patient groups, they're just consumer citizens. They just want to consume. We in the 90s, we had a sense of the collective. We, we fought for HIV AIDS, but it was for the whole country, for solidarity. So they almost transform, they kind of minimize the political force of this. And there is an aggregate force there. But it also forces us to think of, of citizenship you know, in different terms, in more complicated terms. But it also forces us to see statecraft and public administration, as someone asked, in different, in different terms. You know? So in some ways, I think I'm trying to, to, you know, to, to, to give a, like a political force to these characters in their ambiguity, in their day-to-day -day interactions. You know? yeah. So first, thank you, Carolyn. I'll I, I try to, to cover all, the, all the, the questions. And thank you, everybody, for, for the comments. They, they are very, very useful. They clarify ideas. Uh, first, uh, Bruno is not here. But uh, I, I should have said that all this is highly urban. This is not a, an equation in terms of household, uh, way you deal with, with your elder and with your children in rural and far areas. When we run data from Brazil in the world and as a whole and control for urban and rural, it's clear. It's a point. It's hard cities. Uh, the, the, I think you were right when you say uh, I'm sure that uh, a move toward professionalization could be really a good idea. Uh, if I try to answer this, taking Brazilian framing uh, as a reference, I'll say yes for them because uh, it's a move toward rights. For those groups, uh, professional regulation, uh, even though as domestic workers, uh, as part of the uh, house workers, uh, uh, 
is three different uh, different uh, reasons. First, if you take this in international comparative perspective, it has not to be like this. No. We are not necessarily seen if we take aged societies like France or super aged societies like Japan. No. It's not exactly the, this move. They are becoming the new mates. No. They, they can be or not. In the individual term, because they, they are investing in a career no? to really escape from this world, I would say. In the institutional arrangement in terms of mode of, of care provision, it's not what we see when we compare with other countries. No? But it's true there will be a group that will, that will remain there no? as qualified, new type of qualified uh, homework done specifically for elder people, it's true. But I wouldn't say that this will be uh, the most important uh, move this group will take. Now, again, there is another issue I, I had at the time to, 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 to refer. There is a class question on this. Uh, Who might provide service? Who might provide care service? Uh, this, this type of, of, uh, of uh, less qualified, bad paid care, home care service is overall provided for middle class, low middle class, because upper class, rich people, they can afford paying very good long term institutions for their health. It's not exactly the way they do. Or at least they can use highly qualified type of professionals in care work, not for <coughs> employers exactly. They can come in, in a supplementary way, but not they are another mainstream. So th there is a class divide on, on, on this. We, 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 we don't really explore in the Brazilian case. Bill Assoge is doing some research on, on this direction at this point. Huh? I think oh, we, we do have lunch in the hallway. We can talk with Sean about photography there. And uh, I'd like to thank you all. Thank you guys for the great experience.